Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is J.D. I'm a great fly colleague. Hi, everybody. Only by the grace of a merciful, loving God of my own understanding, this fellowship, people like you that understand me, I haven't had a drink today, and I'm very, very grateful. This old man's grateful to be anywhere sober. Uh, I first want to thank the committee and, and Tina and Frank for being such a good host and having getting me to be a part of this beautiful movement. Uh, I love Florida, and uh, it's just beautiful. It's just uh, a little piece of heaven. I, when I come to Florida, I like to come uh, on vacations. But uh, I, uh, my sponsor always tell me to tell my sobriety date. My sobriety date is <clears throat> January the 6th, 1977. And... Uh, I'm very grateful, only by God's grace. Anyway, uh, to get with it, I was uh, born up in North Arkansas in a little old town, farm town called Patterson, Arkansas, in Woodruff County. And my father was a farm, a uh, cotton farmer, but uh, a different cotton farmer. He was a sharecropper farmer, and that means we were very poor. And we owed our soul to the mercantile store. And uh, we didn't have nothing. I would, uh, but, but my home, it didn't cause me to drink. It was love in my home. And I had uh, a good family. They did the best they could. Uh, when I was born, it was kind of coming out of a depression. And after I grew up, poor people stays in a depression most of the time anyway. And so, but uh, I... Uh, I had a good good family. My folks uh, was loving. My dad, he was a, a workaholic. Uh, he never drank, and I saw, saw him drunk once. But uh, uh, we wasn't made to go to church, but, but uh, we wasn't made not to go to church. My mom went to church, but my dad would not go. He worked. But anyway, I, uh, by trade, I'm a welder. Now, I've been welded most of my life, uh, ever since I was 17, and I'm still working. And uh, I thought about retiring about uh, four years ago when I got 65. Uh, I, I just thought about it. But Mary Pearl did something that changed my mind. She set a suitcase and a dinner bucket on the front porch and said, Old oh, man, which one are you going to take? <laughs> well, I, did, I, I liked her cooking. She's mean, but she's good. <laughs> and I didn't want to throw my two poodles into a broken home. And so I still carry that dinner bucket. <laughs> Anyway, I, I, back, going back to my family, uh, I had three brothers, and uh, me and my oldest brother fought all the time. I heard my dad tell my mom, uh, you know, my dad and my mom, my dad called my mom Miss Virgie, and my mom called my dad Mr. Clint. And I, I never heard them fight. Evidently, they, I'm sure behind doors they fussed a little bit, but... He taught us boys at an early age, do not hit on a woman. Of course, now, he never met Mary Pearl, or he'd say, Ex <laughs> Ex except you, little Jimmy. But he did. And I, as far as I know, my three brothers does not hit on women. And we never have. I never hit my ex-wife, and I never hit, I've never hit the murk. Until <laughs> I got sober. <laughs> Anyway, uh, I heard my dad tell, talk to my mom. said, them boys are not normal. They fight all the time. And, you know, we fought, fought. And my dad, uh, there's one thing that he taught me. That I'd never whip my children when I grew up mad. But I had some spoiled children, but I didn't. But 
he would uh, whip us severely when he got mad, and, and I've missed school over it, and nowadays they'd lock him up in a Humane Society ward or somewhere, but I'm telling you, it would be pitiful. <laughs> he wouldn't uh, cut a switch. He'd pull up, he's a big guy, kind of like Mark, and he'd pull up a tree, <laughs> small tree. Yeah. I always accused my brother of getting the saw coat. He'd whip, in, whip us with a root end and, and, and a, a mud and a dirt would protect my brother, but he was down to bare roots when he got to me. <laughs> but anyway, I uh, quit in the 10th grade. I went through grade school and I quit in the 10th grade. And uh, I wanted to go uh, to join the guards and, and go to a welding school, which I've been to seven since. And uh, the last school... School I went to was a plasma welder, which puts on hard pacing on the core faces and uh, into core and valves, and that's what I build today. Anyway, I went off to school. I had what I come back. Uh, I met this is a high school sweetheart of mine. We, I got her in a little family way, and uh, but I learned earlier that. Uh, when I really had my concept of God is when I uh, I went to church. I didn't go to church until I, I got up, and then more girls started looking real pretty down there. Man, I said, well, I'm going to go to church. And <laughs> grabbed me one of them, and sure enough, I did. And we played the... Hello. And we... <laughs> And we play post office, you know. Uh, and then we went to church. Uh, uh, one weekend, this, her parents just got out of town, and so I went by and got her. We played a little post office and went on to church, sat on the front row. And then this little town that we lived in, the rich people went to the Methodists and the, and the poor people went to the Holiness. And so I was on the front row in this Holiness church, and this preacher this brimstone, he slapped, evidently, I thought he was talking to me, but his, his son did talk on adultery. And he slapped that podium and he looked right straight at me and that little girl and said, if you commit adultery, you will go to hell and you'll burn forever and ever and you'll beg for rocks to fall on you. We slid down that pew. <laughs> But you know, that was good. I, I like to play post office, and I never did. I didn't quit for that preacher, and I didn't quit for God. And after that, I become a postmaster. <laughs> Until I got to you folks. <laughs> now, going back to my high school sweetheart, I, we played post office, and I got her in a motherly way. And uh, back where I come from, country fied, we call it knocked up. Well, <laughs> anyway, I, I, even back then, when I was that age, nineteen, I could either you could either marry your woman or either go to up north and work in a car factory or either go join the army. I was too little to join the army. I didn't like that, so I married her because I did love the girl. I thought, you know, pretty much, and. Uh, <laughs> We got married, and uh, she's from a broken home, and her uh, mother come to Little Rock, and I went down to see her, you know, and he, she had a stepdad, and he worked in Arizona, Phoenix. He said, J.D., if you'll save your coins and come to Phoenix, I'll get you an apprentice plumber. You'll be an apprentice plumber, and you'll be a plumber. You'll make good money. I said, okay. So I talked it over with my little wife, and we did. We moved out there. But while I was waiting, I got me a well job, and I liked it better, so I just kept it. And we lived out there for 13 years, had two children, a boy and a girl. And, you know, Arizona is where I really learned to drink, because uh, they, the water tastes horrible. <laughs> when you get out with a well job, uh, you just open up a six-pack and drink, you know. And uh, and it got bad, it got worse, and it, but... but in the meanwhile, me and this first wife sat down. We could really see the world as it is. And we sat down and we talked. She wasn't a fighter like Merck. She was kind of quiet. She said uh, we figured that we could 
buy all these material things and retire at the age of 40. And uh, we bought our own home and everything and have these two kids and I could send them to college on welders, wages. She become a telephone operator, foreman, and she went to work. And we decided to get all these material things and then we could retire. Well, I worked day and night, part-time job on Saturday. But she must have doubtly got bored because she got her a boyfriend. Uh, of all boyfriends, a beauty operator. <laughs> One of them men, beauty operators. And, and you know, uh, I was so busy, she uh, messed with him for a year and fell in love with him, you know. So she told me I come in from work one time. She said, I will talk to you when you get out of the shower. I said, okay. I got out of the shower and went out there. She said, I want to tell you something. I've been seeing a man for a year. You're so dumb, so damn dumb you couldn't notice. <laughs> I'm gonna, I want a divorce. You can take it like a man or cry like a baby. But I'm going to get a divorce. I said, okay. You know, it really flowed with me. And you know, there is worth something I couldn't accept. Uh, that's when I crawled in a bottle. Now, she went on and lived her life, and it was about as always is. But I stayed in a bottle until I, I met you people. And uh, I felt sorry for poor little J.D., as usual. And, and, but I worked, and I stayed drunk to keep him, you know, bothering this guy. I kept bothering him because, you know, he... He was a, a he wasn't a gay guy, but I mean he was just a sissy, you know, working on <laughs> them women. He's a big guy, and I'd go up there and want to fight him, and he'd say, "Stay away from me," and all that. So I would go by and pick on his car, his parked up, <laughs> take a hammer and knock the glasses and the lights out. He's afraid of me, or he'd call the law if he didn't ever did. So I had me a welder at that time of my own on a flatbed truck, and I, I was in business for myself then. <laughs> so I followed them guys around, and he, him and my wife went out to eat. I watched him in the background, had me a bottle, Jack Daniels, boy, it's good stuff. And then when they went inside, they made a mistake and parked by a light pole. <laughs> I had a big chain on that truck. I went over there and set up like I was doing, working for the city, set up my shields. I welded that chain around that axle, around that pole, welded it good. <laughs> then I went and parked out in the background to watch the action. I bet it was in action, too. They, uh, they backed up, and, well, you know, he first opened the door for her, you know, like a little sissy does. <laughs> Then he got in and fired that thing up and backed up, and both of them hit the windshield. <laughs> I watched that car. It sat there for three days. I don't know how they ever got it, but somebody must have cut it loose because it was gone one evening. I went to work. But they called a cab and left. And, but that was one of my good things about my wife running around, some funny things that I really enjoyed. <laughs> But I'd get drunk and bother that man, and if I'd go there today and try to make amends to him, he'd run. But I kept bothering him, and the policeman told me, he said, if something ever happens to that guy, we're coming after you. He said, it'd be good if you'd leave. And so, uh, but before that, I ran into a guy in a beer joint. He asked me, was that my rig out front? I said, yeah, and it's not for sale. He said, I don't want to buy it, I want to hire it. I said, well, he said, well, he said, man, you can make some money. And I told him about my wife. He said, well, you don't need to think about that. I'll get your mind off of that. I said this. And the old man drank the heavy, too. I said, man, he must be alcoholic or something, you know. <laughs> so anyway, I thought he was beer talk, but he was true. He, he said that he knew a place that he could take over a steel shop. We could run it at night. He hired some Mexicans, and we'd run it, and we'd build those sanitary to tub for Mason Tempe, and we made a lot of money. In it. But I got to drifting away and getting in trouble. And that's when the law talked to me. But uh, we would uh, 
drank whiskey, and then for lunch we'd go have a six pack. And then he taught me how to drink wine in the morning. He said, "Freeze it, put it up in the freezer, and drink it real cold, and boy, it did for good breakfast." <laughs> and we hit the trail. Well, anyway, I got to mess around or leaving him, and I, and I got to getting in trouble. So my dad at that time. I had lung cancer, and he was taking out one of his lungs, and I, I figured I better come back and check on him. But and then when I come back, I was able to go over at California work in the shipyard, but I was going to go see my dad before he, you know, went out of the hospital. So I went back there, had a little MGA, and drove back there and see my dad. And, and, you know, my mom just couldn't believe it. She hadn't saw me since no, I've been a couple of few years, and, and I just got to where that I was a filthy mouth. I, I wasn't good to be around people, uh, anyway, decent people. I, I, I worked in steel mills. And they talked rough. They played hard, but we worked hard. And uh, they just had a, a nasty mouth. And my mom watched children, you know, take care of some people. And when I'd come by there, She'd have to huddle them little kids because my mouth was too filthy to even be around little children. And she finally told me to quit coming around until I clean up and because uh, I got to live in the bars and just, just wherever I could find something to do, you know, and got where I wasn't able to work. And she said, don't come by there while you like this, Jimmy. She said, uh, I've got children here and they don't need to be around somebody that talks like you. Besides, clean up. I said, okay, that hurt my feelings, you know. I need to go by there for a while. <laughs> but anyway, I come by there one day, and she told me, she said, J.D., you ought to get married. I said, yeah, let's quit hanging out in them bad places. Get you a good woman. I, I, I said, well, what will I do? She said, go to church. Find you a good woman. And so I went to church. And this little old lady outside the church after I got out, she says, you're new here, aren't you, son? <clears throat> I said, yes, ma'am, I'm over here to hunt me a wife. <laughs> she said, uh, you find any? I said, no, ma'am, all of them too old. <laughs> she said, that ain't the way you do that, son. She said, uh, you, uh, you ask God to help you find a wife. And she said, he's probably looking for your wife right now. And I said, Okay. I didn't ask God, but I, I knew he was looking for one. And it wasn't but two weeks, my little brother introduced me to Mary Pearl. Now, I just knew God sent her my way. <laughs> you know, I always did want a woman that had a little spunk and had been married before. And boy, I overdone it in that spunk part. <laughs> well, I tell you. She was quite a ride, but I tell you, we, uh, she, uh, well, she's pretty good to drink with. She didn't drink like I did, but, you know, she, uh, always watching stuff and pray she'd get sleepy when she drank. Uh, <laughs> but we, uh, went along around, like in her story, she said, we got married, we got married, we shacked together a little while. And uh, would nobody come see us? My mom wouldn't. Said y'all living in sin, and I ain't coming over. Her mother was surely wouldn't. And so we got married. And I'm telling you, it it got bad there at first. You know, at first it wasn't too bad, but the, you know it got really bad in there. And violence started. And she was just so sweet till we got married. <laughs> the sweetness left, just like you say. She is good. She is mean. But I, I went out with her right away, you know, when, when I was going with her. I knew, I noticed a lot of things about Mary Pearl that <clears throat> she didn't fight like women, you know. And of course, she do all the fighting. Right? And uh, she didn't scratch, pull hair. She's a boy. I mean, she'd uh, whop you like a man, you know, <laughs> and build you up for a roundhouse. And if she ever hits you at that roundhouse, He's out of it. You see stars, you breathe real slow. Uh, she'd come to you with them left and right, and, and you know, he'd say, y'all quit, boy, I tell you. But we, uh, it got so bad that, uh, that 
we I went to a doctor and I I, I got some help and finally went to a a they thought she was an alcoholic and I was Al Anon. <laughs> But, you know, we had some fun. We had some, a lot of fun. A lot of it I didn't remember. <laughs> but <clears throat> she was pretty good. I'd uh, go off for two or three days. She'd sent me after some vinegar. And I'd stay gone for a couple of days. <laughs> Come back and I'd convince her that I hadn't been gone very long. <laughs> and before long, she would take it. She would buy that. I had her sick, buddy. I mean, she was going my way. <laughs> but anyway, I got into AA. And uh, after we got married, I got me a sponsor right off. Uh, this old man's a tall, lanky guy, Durwood. And uh, never been married. And he uh, shake your hands so hard you nearly jerk you to your knees. <laughs> he told me, he said, you don't be, I'm going to be your sponsor. And so he, uh, I didn't have a job. I got fired. And uh, it, it hurt my ego because I'd never been fired before. And uh, and I, I, he said, well, J.D., while you're off, I'd already start going to AA a little bit. He said, while you're off, why don't you go to a, a, a serenity house and, and, and find out what how J.D. ticks? I said, okay. You know, I did so he dumped me out down there because he worked for the railroad and he'd come by and see me every night and old Durwood is uh, he did some things uh, like uh, like he he wasn't afraid to marry Pearl we went off to a meeting one night and he as in the guy asked, would, asked him would he go on a 12 step call and he said yeah uh, I've got a new guy with me JD I'm going to take him with us he needs to experience and so I went, and you know this old bachelor guy, as a bachelor, he never did have to call home, check in with his wife. So I figured when I'm him, with him, I didn't have to do that. <laughs> well, about 2 o'clock we come in, because boy, we get back and got some AA out of the booth. And we, we, when I come in, the lights is all on. And old Durwood says, J.D., you got company? I said, no, no, it ain't nothing like that. <laughs> I said, you, you might ought to let me go in first, Durwood. I've, I've seen that too many times. And I went in there, and she was all squared away, ready to go, just like she always was. And the meanwhile, old Durwood went right by me, got right to her face, and told her right to her face, man, and said, if you don't get off of J.D.'s ass and go to al he's going to get drunk. God, boy, I want to say that so many times. <laughs> Boy, I, he always told me don't put him on a pedestal. And boy, he was up there on top. Boy, I was proud of that man. So that old boy knows. He had to sell balls on him, boy, I tell you. <laughs> man, he didn't even have to do but look at his chair. I'd get it for him, coffee. And, and, and you had to, to get old Durwood a cup of coffee, you had to be kind of like a chemist. You got to put honey in it, sugar, milk, stir it the right way. If you don't, it'll clabber. But I did it right. He liked my coffee. And uh, so I got in the serenity house and got all settled down. And I knew if the old man, I was afraid that Mary Pearl would hit him. See, when he went right by me, I said, hell, she wouldn't even have to set him up for that roundhouse. But she didn't hit him for some reason. Anyway, I was sure proud of that old man. And uh, he could do for me what I couldn't do. And I said, that was one brave old man. He might have been a bachelor, but boy, he knew how to handle women. <laughs> anyway, he carried me over to this year, uh, a strange house, like I said, in North Hall on Parker Street. And uh, I thought it looked like a dump, but anyway, went in there, it looked like a run down, all them guys in there. And I was shaking, scared, leave me in there, and I was wanting to drink, worrying about things, about who, who was sitting on my bar stool and who was flirting with my barmaid. You know, it, it's stuff like that worried me when I first went in there. 
I really got, and they had a, a glass thing, uh, a cabinet in there in, in the office that had a, a bottle of whiskey in it, but it was locked. And it was for, I didn't know this until I got out, that that was for people that went into DTs. And I can see why they wouldn't tell. I went into a DT that first day. <laughs> well, I watched them how they did it. <laughs> I've been in a few myself. Uh, I was over at a meeting, Mary Pearl, and I will tell you about this before I forget it. I, we went to a meeting at Joe's Shrine House on Saturday nights because I got put on night shift. I had to make meetings during the weekend on the weekends. I went to and there's a, a black guy that spoke. I mean, he raised his hand to talk every time. And I couldn't understand him. He talked, you know, a language that I couldn't. Uh, now, the black people would understand him, and they would laugh. But I'd say, maybe I ain't hearing good, so I'd get on the front row. <laughs> and that time I was smoking pipe. I still couldn't understand it. So I went to sleep, and I fell on the floor. <laughs> Broke my pipe. And this black lady across the aisle said, Lord, that child's going to seizures. Don't let him swallow his tongue. <laughs> It scared me when I woke up, so I jerked a little bit to make it look good. <laughs> so it wouldn't embarrass me. <laughs> but anyway, back in that serenity house, old Durwood would come by and see me. And he, I told him, you know, we had a, a old fella. You know, I used to judge people by looks. If I didn't like their looks, they wouldn't get close to me. Or if they didn't drink like I did, they wouldn't get close to me. And this old Counselor was a hunchback guy. Had that first meeting every morning. I didn't like him because he reminded me of a math teacher, and that math teacher used to whip me on a daily basis. And I said, he ain't getting close to me. But I got to noticing that all the young guys was following him around between meetings. And, uh, you know, they didn't think that I was going to make it. They even called Mary Pearl in and told her. It had, I could go to meetings all day and they interviewed me at night and I couldn't remember what we'd done or what we talked about and, and I, 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 she, she, I got on the outpatient basis where he'd come and get me every morning uh, take me every morning and leave me at night and Mary Pearl said you better be here when I get in and I, well, I was there so there wasn't no place else to go and she picked me up one time she picked me up and she told me to go get in the car and she come out crying and I said what they do to you in there you know I, I drunk this yeah. she said nothing it don't concern you which later I found out that they told her they didn't think I was going to make it I had severe so much brain damage but you know uh, I got to want a bottle so bad one day I went into this old hunchback guy crying I told him I wanted to drink I had I almost leave because I wanted to drink. I couldn't go home, but I was leaving. And he said, you know, that I have that first class. And I read you that 24-hour book every morning. And, you know, I share my my God with you guys. And, I, and you said the other day you wanted to borrow my God. And I said, he said, you need to get your own, J.D. Ask God. And I said, I don't know how to pray. And he said, just talk to him. And he said, That'll help. he'll help you when you're drinking. I'd go home at night, Mary Pearl picked me up, I'd leave like an animal. I, I knew there wasn't no booze in them drawers and places where I hid it, but I'd have to look, you know, and I was just like an animal. And so I tried what he did. I went out under the old country, and I told God, I said, God, I don't understand it. I don't understand what you got, but I want that thing called uh, AA, and I want to have a program what they keep telling me to get. You know, the next morning, I went back to those classes. It's kind of like dipping your face out of a muddy pan of water. I could listen, uh, and I, they interviewed me that day, and that evening, and I didn't only tell them the topic. I told them the people the name it shared. And so I knew God was working in my life at that time. I knew that. Anyway, uh, Every week, this old man would speak in Benton at the nut house down there. He'd talk, and uh, he told we talked that day in classes about water brain. And he talked AA all the way over. He, if he catch a couple of guys that was really interested in the program, he'd take them with him. 
And I, I, he took me a couple of times. Uh, that's some of my best days. I put some of the best clothes I had left on and going. And he cared and showed us boys a, a water brain. And I'm telling you, it's pitiful. It scared me. I mean, this kid was not old. He wasn't as old as I was. He was playing with dogs. He said it. He explained to us that he just drank so much alcohol that his brain saturated too much that it just, you know, couldn't function. And that's just about where I was headed if I hadn't, after later on, I found out. But anyway, Mr. Arnold got to be a real, you know, he'd tell us things out of the big book. And then later on, you say, well, that's what that old man meant, because I couldn't grasp it when he's talking. But anyway, Oak Derby would come by there one day, my sponsor. I picked him a cup of coffee. I says, go outside. I got something to ask you. I want you to tell me. And you know, old Durwood always did that to me. Uh, I've outlived two of my sponsors, so I'm on my third one today, but this was my first one. And he smoked that old rogue yawn, and I told him, I said, you know, we studied brain damage today and water brain. I said, I want you to tell me, and he was rolling a cigarette when he was doing it, and tell me just how much of that Damages do I have, Durwood? You ought to know, you know, you're my sponsor. He rolled that, that cigarette. You know, he, he always looked off, looked like he's in a coma, but he really was. <laughs> anyway, when he got through, he lit that cigarette and take it over. And I was sitting there waiting because I knew it was going to be bad because he'd take too long. He said, you're not drinking, are you, boy? I said, Lord, no. He said, don't worry about it. God, that hurt me because, see, that there is what is the way he'd do me on a lot of stuff. He'd leave me dangling. Wouldn't quite come out and tell me the truth. That used to really irritate me. Anyway, during my drinking, I wanted to tell you a while ago, I was a sensitive person. And I didn't, and, and, and little, and, and I suffered hard. And uh, I never weighed 100 pounds until I got 22. And these big guys like, Mark would come in a bar and eat a boiled egg. And I'd be down there by myself, minding my own business. He'd say, hey, Runt, pass me that salt. I would, it would hurt to the bone. I'd get two weeks drunk over some little old stuff like that. It was pitiful. But anyway, going back to Serenity House. I say, I forgot that. I wanted to get that in there while I go, Mark, but I forgot it. <laughs> anyway, Durwood uh, uh, saved my life. He helped me walk, walk me through the steps, and 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 we uh, we uh, learned a lot with Durwood. He took me to meetings every even before I got into Serenity House. He'd take me to meetings every day and buy me a book at each one of these Serenity houses. And uh, he was uh, he hurt my feelings one time. We went to convention. And I told him, went up to him and told him, I said, Durwood, I want to thank you for all you've done for me. And he says, that ain't the way it's done, boy. I said, well, I'm ungrateful. Hmm. <laughs> said, that ain't the way it's done. He said, you help somebody else, you know. And I said, oh, okay. I said, I don't know nobody. He said, well, you won't learn nobody hanging around me. Get out there and <laughs> meet people. And I did. And I remember the Murp and I went to our that convention she was telling you about it last night in her story. And I know when, when we left, I cried because I, I loved it so well. It, uh, I never had been places where they wanted me very much. And she pulled that old wagon over and she said, J.D., that's okay. She said, uh, we'll go home, save our coins, and come back. And that's the way I got started. And, and I tell you, it... Anyway, uh, my my old sponsor died, died with lung cancer. And I got me another one. It seemed like every one I get, I died with lung cancer. I got another real good one, at a cowboy. And he died. But this one I got now is from California, and he's got 33 years, and he's pretty sharp. He he, he used to he lives in Mayflower, Arkansas now, and he's he's real. Real good to me. Anyway, we learned a lot. And, uh, you know, Mary Pearl and I, after I got into the program, we don't have to fight like we used to. 
uh, we love each other today and she's awful good to me and I'm good I, I work and she works and we both enjoy the, this this program we really do she goes to a lot of meetings and, and I go with her a lot of them and I think the best thing if you had never went on a cruise and spoke on one of you they need to because that's a, really a, a neat deal and God's been awful good to us. Uh, we've got to go to a lot of places. And uh, I've been, uh, I used to go with Mary Pearl and get real nervous. Uh, I, I remember one time we was in Hawaii and, and I had a meeting under the trees. I got nervous for her because you couldn't see nothing but heads. And I said, Mary Pearl, that's all I do. Are you scared? She said, no. Anyway, we've been to a lot of beautiful places. I'm telling you. I wish I could be like that. A lot of people uh, speak, you know, I'm really no speaker. A lot of people speak and war, uh, it's like washing their hands. Man, I have to get all nervous, sick, and diarrhea, and all that good stuff. <laughs> I'm getting better. I'm getting better. But anyway, uh, I, I hate to keep rumbling. And it's a little early for me to sit down, but uh, it, is it okay? Okay. <laughs> I have to check with my boss lady. Now she'll tell me we're still out of trouble now. But anyway, I want to share J.D.'s God with you folks. You know, that counselor that I didn't like at first, I've become to love him. He's the only person outside myself that I did love. I knew there was a difference in feelings from my brothers, my father, but Mr. Arnold was the first person outside of myself I loved it when I was in the Serenity House. and We had a meeting one day, and he, I wasn't out of the Serenity House yet. And uh, he said, J.D., explain your God to me. I said, I'm burning, Mr. Arnold. I knew that back when I went to that church that day, and that preacher told me, he said, God's up there marking down, and I've been real bad. I've done a lot of bad things, a lot of bad things I've done intentionally. Knew, knowing it was wrong, so I'm burning. He laughed, and he says, J.D., if that was true, would none of us have a chance? He said, when you was doing all that bad stuff, he said, God didn't approve of it, but he never quit loving you. He said, God's got a love that's don't even compare to our love here on earth. And I said, Mr. Arnold, you mean the things that I've done on purposely? He said, he still loves you. And you know, uh, that's something that, I'm kind of like Mark, I'm so grateful about the, the God in my life. You know, I, I come back close to missing the whole thing if I hadn't found I am. And if I hadn't met Mary Pearl, I believe that uh, she cared enough for me to stick with me seven years of our marriage and my rough drinking. And uh, I will share you the experience that I have. There is no, no depth or no height or no measure that you can get with your God if you're on understanding. And uh, I know by experience I've been there and I, I want to thank each and every one of you for listening to me, and I love each and every one of you. I got a, I got a, a poem to read first. I forgot to tell you about that one, but I'm gonna read it anyway. It come, it come out of the 24-hour book, Jan, January the sixth, I believe, and I just love it. I keep going back and reading it over and over. But if we'd live by this, it would be a lot better. It says, look at the world. It's your father's house. Think of all the people you meet as guests at your father's house to be treated with love and consideration. Look at yourself as a servant in your father's house, as a servant of all. Think of no work as beneath you. Be ever ready to help others or need your help. There is gladness in God's service. There is much satisfaction in serving the highest you know. Express your love to God and service to all who are living with you in your Father's house. Thank you.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.